Um, it is just a huge pleasure every time I get to do this to welcome to the program Dr. Stephen Meyer. He received his PhD in the philosophy of science from the University of Cambridge. He's a former geophysicist and college professor. He now directs the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. He's authored a ton of of uh, books, New York Times bestsellers, Darwin's Doubt, The Explosive Origin of Animal Animal Life and the Case for Intelligent Design, as well as a book that literally changed my life, um, Signature in the Cell, DNA and the Evidence for uh, Intelligent Design. A book I found, I think I told you this, Stephen, by, um, by Googling the phrase one night, DNA as computer code, and boom, landed on your book, and I found that I wasn't insane, then I thought DNA looked like uh, computer code. So welcome to the Todd Herman Show, Dr. Meyer. It's great to be with you again, Todd. I appreciate it, Stephen. Um, this week, I wanted to chat with you because um, some journalists, they sat down and they corrected Ben Carson. Ben Carson, I guess he's some kind of, I don't know, pharmacist or brain surgeon or something. And he thinks that um, there is uh, it's impossible, he says, that human life came from just random mutation. He thinks it's too complex. The universe is too complex. So he's being mocked for that. So I thought I might uh, bring you on just to... You know, provide the balance to this that the media simply won't do. Well, it is kind of ironic. You know, you've got a guy who's a very accomplished uh, neuroscientist and neurosurgeon who has scientific-based doubts about the theory of evolution, and you've got journalists who say, "Well, he must be an ignorant, uh, uh, an ignorant person for for, think, for thinking such things." What they don't know, and what I, what, one of the things I document in, in my latest book, Darwin's Doubt, is that leading evolutionary biologists themselves are now openly doubting the creative power of the standard uh, random mutation natural selection mechanism that we all learn about in our high school and college biology textbooks. Um, and there are many, many reasons for that. The biggest reason that, that I discuss in my book is that um, the, the random mutation uh, selection mechanism is not an effective way of generating new digital code, and yet the DNA molecule stores digital code, which is precisely what's necessary to build any new form of animal life. And I think most of us can understand that in in this town by analogy, because we've got software people all around us. If you've got a section of, of functioning software code, and uh, you want to, and you start changing the zeros and ones in that code at random, you're going to degrade the information you have long before you're going to generate a new a new program or operating <laughs> system. And the same kind of considerations apply to life. And so as we realize that building new forms of life requires lots of new information stored in DNA and other places, uh, we've also, I think, increasing number of scientists have recognized that uh, randomly changing the, those uh, genetic bit strings is not not going to be an effective way of generating the required information. And so it's a big unsolved problem. And scientists like uh, Ben Carson are well within their rights to uh, have a, express um, some healthy skepticism about the whole story. Yeah, I, I particularly, you know, I found it uh, ironic that, uh, as you'd said when we were talking before the interview, that, you know, hey, what, what, what do they know? They're journalists. Or what does he know? They're journalists. I also find it interesting that this has become politicized. And, and really, honestly, it's such a sad state that, um, that politics has uh, you now succeeded in politicizing science. But I would point out that the same people criticizing Ben Carson uh, for his perception and belief that life did not come about randomly, that it is information, that it's far too complex to come about randomly. Your book, both of your books detail that. But you know, to me, Signature in the Cell just blew that up forever, um, just based upon the probabilities and unlikelihood. Of that happening, you know, through mathematical probabilities. This is the same audience, though, Dr. Stephen Meyer, who would say to Ben Carson, how can you rely on a constitution written by old white men when, in fact, Darwin himself had no, and you can't blame him, he was a smart guy, but he had no knowledge that DNA existed. Did he? Did he have any knowledge of the, of the actual structure of the cell or oh, of no, DNA? No, no, no. The, uh, DNA was, uh, the, the, the structure of DNA was elucidated in 1953 by yeah. Watson and Crick, and I think even more importantly, its function was elucidated over the next 10 to 12 years in something that's now called the Molecular Biological Revolution. And an important event in the middle of that revolution was Francis Crick's insight, Crick having been a code breaker in World War II. Uh, he had an insight known as the sequence hypothesis in which he realized that the four chemical subunits on the inside of the twisting helix uh, known as DNA, those, those, those four uh, subunits are functioning like alphabetic characters in a written language or uh, digital characters in a section of machine code. In fact, our own local hero here, uh, Bill Gates, has said DNA is like a software program, yeah. only much more complex than anything we've ever created. And we know 
from our uniform and repeated experience, which is the basis of all scientific reasoning, that, uh, that code and information generally always arise from uh, programmers or from <laughs> intelligent sources. And so the discovery of that information at the foundation of life, I think, is a stop-press moment in the history of, of science because it's pointing not to undirected material processes, but based again on our experience, it's pointing to the activity of a designing mind. Yeah, in, in the in the about four minutes we have left with Dr. Stephen Meyer of the Discovery Institute, I I, I cannot recommend his books enough. Um, Signature in the Cell and Darwin's Doubt. I, I mean, they are fundamental for your understanding of modern science. Um, I was also caught my attention because I think it's under uh, a, a a you know a consistent theme. A woman you're aware of named uh, Susan Schneider, professor of philosophy at the University of Connecticut. She is joined with Seth um, Shostak, a director of NASA's SETI program a NASA astrobiologist, the Library of Congress chair in astrobiology named Stephen Dick, to espouse the view that the dominant life form in the universe is artificial. And they're, they're, they're saying it's hard to argue against this. Can you help me understand how it's hard to see, or how it's hard to argue against that? I, I don't yeah, get Yeah, well, it. first of all, they're, they're, uh, they're speculating that there is a form of intelligence in space, mm. but that intelligence is robotic or artificial. It's <laughs> computer-based. And, uh, and this is, this is um, speculation based on a, materialistic, uh, a, a set of materialistic assumptions. The first and three, and I, I read the article your people sent it over, yeah. and they make three assumptions, all of which are completely unjustified. One is that it's, in, it's easy to get from chemistry to code, and then from code to life. And that's the first <laughs> assumption. So, in other words, the evolution of some form of life is inevitable somewhere in the cosmos uh, if we just have the right chemistry. Um, that has turned out to be very difficult to demonstrate on our planet, where you have a lot of favorable conditions. Really, nobody knows how we got the... Uh, there, there is no accepted uh, theory of chemical evolution that explains how we get from the chemicals in the prebiotic soup to a first living cell. And nearly all evolutionary biologists acknowledge that that's a completely unsolved problem, but they just assume it's an easy problem in this, in this scenario they develop. This, <clears throat> the second thing they assume is that it's easy to get from code to consciousness, that you, we can uh, design machines that will not only do computation, which is what our computers do, we have rule-based computation, but they also assume that our machines will at some point uh, be conscious in the way we are, that when we see blue, they'll see blue the same way. And uh, this is, a, again, a, a completely unsubstantiated and deeply problematic assertion, and yet it's something they just assume in this, in this scenario. And then the third thing they assume is that life is super common in the cosmos, that it's basically inevitable, and that there are so many uh, life-friendly planets out there and such a big universe that, um, that life is, is super common. This, this idea, though, has been amply refuted by a couple of our local professors, uh, including Peter Ward, uh, uh, who's a guy, a guy I've had a number of debates with, but a re really good scientist, and he wrote a book a few years ago called Rare Earth. And what, what, what Ward and Brownlee, his colleagues, show is that um, the, the number of exoplanets that have been discovered is minuscule when you take into account all the conditions that have to be met to allow for life to exist in the universe. There's about 2,000 or so uh, extrasolar planets that have been discovered. Almost all of them are in deeply problematic environments. They uh, are more massive than is, uh, than is uh, conducive to life. They have compact orbits that are too close to their host stars. And a whole bunch of other conditions that have to be met to make life possible are, are, as far as we can tell, not present there, and as far as we can tell, super improbable. We're in an incredibly fortunate uh, uh, solar system. My colleague uh, Guillermo Gonzalez has written a book, which A. Richards called Privileged Planet. Great book. And so, in a sense, these claims about uh, life being inevitable somewhere in the cosmos are taking into account the numerator, how many planets are out there, but they're not taking into uh, account the denominator, which is the extreme number of conditions that have to be met that make a life anywhere extremely improbable. So on all three of these counts, the, the, the folks postulating, speculating that there may be robotic life floating out there in the cosmos are, are just, uh, 
they're on materialistic uh, speculation. It's, it's materialistic speculation on steroids. Well, it's, uh, Stephen Meyer, it, it's always too short. I want to do an hour with you next time. Um, so fascinating. Listen, you can go to Stephen Meyer. It's Stephen with a PH, the way it's supposed to be spelled. Uh, StephenCMeyer.org. Read about the man, his work. I suggest you buy his books. And I would just close this out, Dr. Meyer, because we've got to run you know, into this break. That I find it fascinating that, like Richard Dawkins, they'd rather believe in robots, really smart robots, than a god or an intelligent designer of some other form. And I know your work's not about God, it's about intelligent design. So, Well, I, I think intelligent design does have theistic implications. Yeah. And when, when we were in the film with Ben Stein called Expelled and Richard mm-hmm. Dawkins floated this speculation that there might be a space alien, I remember Ben saying off camera, you know, he called it the ABG hypothesis, anything but God. <laughs> and, and I think the most, you know, once you realize that there's design and life, there's evidence of design in the code of life, and there's evidence of design in the very fabric of the universe, what physicists talk about when they're, uh, when they're discussing the fine-tuning of the universe. I think, I think the God hypothesis is very credible, and uh, I think it's far more credible than the idea of, of disembodied robots floating in space that have evolved by undirected, unguided processes. I, I totally agree. Uh, Dr. Meyer, it's an honor, uh, just a joy to be with you. Next time, we've got to get you down to the uh, studio, and we'll do a full hour and take questions from people. Sounds great. All right, thank you very much. Stephen Meyer. You bet. Bye-bye.